All right, welcome to the Lead Generation World Podcast. My name is Mike. Uh, we've got a good show for you today. We've got Rob Seaver, who is the uh, director of the Leads Council, um, with us today. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things uh, with regards to regulations, the state of the industry, what they're up to at the Leads Council, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, just a couple notes. We've got uh, Lead Generation World London, which is actually now live for registration. That's going to be taking place in October, um, with uh, assuming everything goes uh, as planned um, and where you've got this coronavirus thing under wraps by them. Um, if not, uh, and you do register, uh, we'll provide a full refund and fully guarantee um, your your investment in the show. So don't worry. Um, if you're interested in going to Lead Generation World London, please. Please go to leadgenerationworld.com forward slash London and you can uh, register today. It's going to be a great show. You can also take a look at the agenda, which is still in the works, but um, there's still a lot of good uh, sessions that are being uploaded on a regular basis. So take a look at that. Um, but without fur any further ado, let's go ahead and bring Rob in and start talking a little uh, lead generation shop. All right, everyone. Welcome to uh, the lead Generation World Podcast. My name is Michael Free. I got Rob Seaver here from uh, the Leeds Council. Welcome, Rob. You can oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> there you go. I was going to say you can uh, you can speak too, not just wave. But <laughs> welcome, welcome oh, to no, I, joining. Uh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no. So, so okay. um, you know, it's it's good to have you on the show. You know, Leeds Council has always well, not maybe not always, but has 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 at least for the last what eight nine years now been a big part of uh, the lead generation industry and promoting best practices and pr promoting uh, information uh, to the industry. So um, I wanted to have you on and talk a little bit about um, what the leads council is up to these days and and really just sort of talk a little bit of shop about the industry and all kinds of stuff. So um, t how long have you been with uh, the leads council? I think it's running up on about five years and, you know, nobody probably knows Leeds Council better than you. Obviously, you handed the reins over to me when I joined and uh, had zero understanding about regulatory and compliance. Yeah. Uh, I was eyes wide open and uh, it, it, it definitely has been a learning process for sure. I can't believe it's been five years. Uh, man, time, time fly. It seems like yesterday, uh, but it's amazing. It's been um, five years, I guess. You know, a little, just a little backstory about the Leeds Council initially from, from my point of view was uh, it was initially founded by Jay Weintraub, uh, who also founded um, LeedsCon, and, um, and also Dave Wangle, who was at the time a part of a company called Targus Info, which is now Newstar. And their both intent uh, in founding it was to, you know, bring the industry together and bring um, a group of leaders and advocates uh, for the industry um, to promote best practices and regulatory issues and create standards uh, for the industry. Um, a year or so after that, I, they asked me to help take it over and did that for about six years. And then we created the board and you took over. And now, now it's run by, um, what, about 15 to 20 board members? And then how many members total? Well, um, it depends on how you group them together, but we have over 450 total members that uh, include, you know, obviously buyers, sellers, technology platforms, uh, service providers to the industry. Um, you know, we are still very much exactly what you said it was originally um, founded for. When we are looking at setting standards and advocating and educating the industry, that's very much our core DNA today. Um, it's written right in our mission. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about it more, like in more detail, what are you guys working on right now? Like what's at the top of the you know, discussion? Uh, uh, well, for, for obviously, example? you know, with COVID things are, are different every day. Um, you know, last year, I will say this, I came into as probably most people in the industry came into the industry very, or into the year, very bullish uh, thinking that, you know, this was going to be a banner year, a record year for the council. And, and, and although I don't think that that's changed in my outlook as it relates to growing the base. In fact, I actually see more opportunity now. It's just shifted. Um, but as the regulatory and compliance in, you know, environment uh, and landscape really amped up in 2019 as we started seeing telephone compliance, 
uh, and the impact on consumers and where the FTC came into that. And then, of course, the, the states, as they started adding privacy laws, obviously one of your, you know, you live in California, so that hit you guys straight in the face. Um, it really started becoming active and complex. And, and, and I felt that that activity and, and complexity plays to the strengths of what the council really was originally started for. And, and so as I continued to go out to a lot of these shows and talk with people uh, in, in these groups, uh, not just the Leeds Con or Legion uh, Ration World ecosystem outside of that, as I started getting to the solar groups and some of the industry groups such as uh, mortgage and, and other groups, it was clear that these people were looking for an answer to how do I find a, a better vendor for this type of service? There's a lot more exposure on my back. We're getting pressure from the state regulatory bodies, from the FTC, the FCC to protect consumers. And we just need to find better sources to buy leads and to partner with people who generate this traffic. So I, I felt it was great. Uh, yeah. and, and our membership growth started to represent that, especially near the end of the year. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously now, like you said, with COVID things relatively, you know, on, on slowed down a little bit, everyone's trying to figure this, this whole thing out to some extent, which um, may even be um, like you said, more important for Leeds council, because um, my guess is that, is that there's, potentially more issues that could arise with TCPA or calling from home or do, you know, utilizing different systems for outbound outreach. Um, I don't, you know, do, do you foresee that as well uh, with people sort of doing this work from home thing? I mean, absolutely. Um, one of the things uh, we have, you know, as you know, we talked about, I have a webinar tomorrow where we're going to ask some of the experts and leaders in the industry and uh, it's clear that these companies immediately shifted to a remote um, call center environment in most cases. And one of the questions I had for them immediately was, you know, how does this impact the, the compliance side of things? What do you have to do to ensure that you, know, you don't run into deeper issues? Um, it was interesting because as I talked to several of the panelists for this webinar, it was clear that it may be different from industry to industry. Um, it may be different uh, from technology, from one company, the platform that they use to run their call center technology versus another company. Um, uh, what was clear is, is that they needed to set up things like VPN so that there was a direct connect back to the company that was secure. It was clear that they had to have the ability to drop in on any call just as if they were sitting you know, in a seat 10 feet from them. Um, it was clear that they had to maintain adherence scripts where I think that was a general concern. If we put people in their home and turn them loose, are they going to go off script? And then therefore, is that going to become a, a compliant issue for me? Um, it, you know, and, and I have to be honest, as much as I'm sounding like I know what I'm talking about, the one thing that I'm clear about is, is that people are still making this up as they go because the just immediate nature of how they had to respond to this. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a cost thing as well, because what I would tell you is that I was talking to one of our companies that had a 200 seat call center here in Tempe, uh, Arizona. And, you know, they, they had to go out and buy, I think, I'm sorry, 2000, you know, they had to go out and buy and provision 2000 laptops and get the technology on those laptops and then get them distributed. And, you know, it's crazy. You can imagine yeah. the retention rate in call centers. How do you keep track of that inventory and make sure that if somebody rolls out, how do you get that back? I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine the complexity that uh, some of these companies are dealing with. Yeah. And before we move on, we're assuming this um, podcast will be pushed out at or after this, the show, uh, the, the, um, the webinar that you're putting on, um, they can come back and what go to leadscouncil.org to, 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 to either download or listen to that uh, webinar. Absolutely. We're recording. And, um, this is one of the shifts in where we're going with some of our membership benefits. Um, this is a time where people need access to information. They need education. They need to be updated. They need to have a sense of community, um, it's unfortunate we're going to see people 
furloughed and laid off temporarily as this, you know, climate, especially the economy continues to evolve. And, you know, we don't want restrictions to that content. And so as soon as we generate it, it's going to be made available publicly. We're going to push out numerous, you know, pieces of communication to make sure people are plugged in and just continue to try to be a resource. Um, you know, one of the concerns I have is, is that you can look at your email chain, you know, any moment of any day, and you're going to see 20 new announcements that there are COVID responses to this and podcast this and that. And so I don't want to get lost in the clutter. I do want to make it easy to consume, but I want people to know that the content that we're generating is going to be very specific to our mission. Uh, we're going to make sure that we put experts and leaders on the panel as, you know, as, uh, as we continue to push this out and, you know, we'll respond as we communicate with our members and, and the community to see what they were looking for and yeah. try to deliver. Did, was there anything, um, you know, there was a conversation outside of, um, uh, well, in a Slack group um, where individuals were talking about actually production um, going up over the last uh, week or so because of work from home, which is, you know, whether it's a sort of a honeymoon period or whatever it may be. But, you know, um, in your initial conversation for the webinar, uh, what were the, were there any conversations around, you um, you know, production and the uh, overall sense of, you know, where certain verticals were doing, were some still just chugging along or were some seeing major declines? Well, I mean, I think that's, it's kind of twofold of what you're asking. Um, yeah. Productivity versus, um, you know, business growth and, and yeah. or reduction. And so from a productivity standpoint, you know, I think you and I even talked about it, um, you know, we're seeing technologies being leveraged right now that uh, whether or not they were eventually going to be leveraged in the future, there's certainly an emphasis to get those in place, such as Slack. You know, you and I, before the webinar, we're playing around with a technology that previously we knew about, probably hesitant to add because we are already overwhelmed with everything we're doing. And now we're being forced to not only um, create it for our own ecosystems, but actually participate in other companies because they're already there. And so um, certainly from a productivity standpoint, I think some people are saying, yes, I'm seeing an uptick in pro productivity. Um, obviously for the concerns that I talked about, you know, getting laptops provisioned and technology in place to support it, there probably has been somewhat of a reduction in some productivity. Um, you know, the, the question that was asked, um, and I think it was Joey Liner or somebody, um, you know, was talking about this, you know, hurrah, we've, we've, we've created an ecosystem that now we're not going to back off of and everybody's real up about it. Is that really here to stay? Will we see as soon as this COVID crisis, you know, reduces or we get back to it? Will we go back to our old ways or will we see some of these things that we've responded to being permanent um, as a result of seeing an uptick? I think you could talk to 10 companies and find very different responses on what their uh, ideas are about this. But what was interesting on the flip side of what I was talking about, the volume of business, some companies are actually seeing an uptick in their volume. I mean, obviously we have everybody staying at home, which means they're not going out to retail, which means they're really dependent on online purchasing. And so, advertising um, is, uh, you know, the advertising spend on a lot of these companies has risen, especially in some areas where maybe one of our companies offers bidet toilets, right? And so mm -hmm. their advertising and their yeah. sales in that unit have actually exploded. And so, you know, I think there's opportunity with this crisis. I think depending on where you entered in and the verticals that you play in. I think there's a lot of nuance between those, but overall, I, I think that this crisis has created, you know, a, a unique situation for a lot of our companies. Yeah, definitely. So um, do you guys have a, um, any, any other podcasts or, or web, webinars already sort of in the works that you can share about or is, are they all too, is we it all? Do. Um, uh, we have a, no, I, I can actually share. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I like to promote this stuff as well. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that we've as a council been working on, uh, in, in, and I, I think I've struggled mainly because we have so many things in motion, 
that this crisis has allowed us to slow down. And then as a result, those companies that might have added bandwidth um, uh, have risen and said, hey, look, they've risen their hand and raised their hand and said, hey, look, we're going to, to help you with some of that content. So we decided to go ahead and create a leadership series. We thought that it was important that we make this not just as a response to the crisis, but also something long term which has been a goal that I've had to be a conduit of education. And so we've created this weekly series, this leadership series. We want to have a diverse range of content. I don't want to always talk about TCPA. I don't want to always talk about the response to the crisis. And so what we've decided to do is each week we'll have a theme. Those themes will be consistent week to week so that if somebody says, look, I really want to plug into regulatory compliance, they'll know that the second week of every month on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, there'll always be a webinar that we're producing that has something to do with compliance and regulatory. Um, at the beginning of every month, the first week will be best practices, third week will be topical issues, and then ask the experts every fourth week. And so I, I'm hoping that that cadence allows people to not be overwhelmed with the additional um, uh, content that we're producing, but I also hope that it becomes something second nature to where every you know Thursday on the second week of every month, I'm going to get a dose of compliance and regulatory. Yeah, I love it. I and love we're recording this. those so that they'll be. Kind yeah, of yeah. No, I love the I love the schedule of it as well because, like you said, it's really um, something that you can expect uh, every month. You know, if it's getting uh, to ask uh, you know board members specific questions of what's going on or or how they're dealing with issues or you know best practice tips, um, they can. You said that's every fourth week of the month. Is that right? Or uh, on the ask. The experts, um, yeah. the, uh, each week is going to have some content every yep. Thursday. Okay. Um, what's really nice is uh, I'm looking at my, con that's why I keep switching to my second yeah, yeah. monitor over here. I'm looking at it and I'm seeing at least 10 weeks worth of content that I already have planned and scheduled. And so um, obviously this came together very quickly and I do intend to have all of that scheduled in on uh, the website very soon. Um, I'm getting a lot of support from a lot of our members who are jumping in and, and, you know, helping me with HubSpot and, and doing some of the campaign driven, you know, creating content, create, this truly has shown me that in the, in the face of crisis, we've got a great community out there. Um, I think you obviously know it, you know, coming off of January show, it, it, it showed how strong this community can be. Mm -hmm. um, at times, it also can show how brutal it can be. But uh, I have really experienced an uptick of just people saying, hey, look, I want to help. I want to be part of this. Yeah. Well, I think it's true. I mean, I think there is um, a, a really good group of companies in this industry that truly want to not only see their own company grow, but but see, you know, the, the benefit of uh, the growth of the whole industry um, and how that can affect their own, own individual business and, and everybody else's and, and are coming together um, to, to help and provide content. Um, you know, we're, I said this too, I mean, we're all little pieces in the cog, right? Uh, that, that make this big thing turn. And um, if we're not, we're just not as efficient and as, as effective. Um, and that's what's so great about this industry that we can all sort of rely on each other, whether it's for lead generation purposes or lead management purposes or whatever it may be. Um, we're all experts in, in certain things that we can leverage each other on. Um, so that's awesome to hear that the Leads Council yeah. is, is sort of utilizing those resources and getting it out there. That's going to be huge for the industry. I think people, I think sometimes they discount the complexity that lead generation and performance marketing brings. I mean, you know, when you, obviously I'm focused on compliance and regulatory, which yeah. is super complex. But when you look at compliance and regulatory for insurance versus mortgage versus EDU, and then you look at the complexities inside of each one of those industries as it relates to marketing and advertising and calling, and I, I mean, uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart for sure. And yeah. so those players who have been in it for a long time, uh, they really are good people and, and they're strong and, 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 and really smart about how they work. And it's a pleasure to work with those people. And I, yeah. I really enjoy it. You know, one of the th well, last thing I say, and then we'll have to jump into uh, the the uh, topic of regulations. We have we can't avoid it. Um, but one thing um, that the uh, Leeds Council I, I I really love about um, the 
the premise of the Leads Council and what you guys are doing now too is that as a lead buyer, um, it was really hard for me at one point in time to, de- to determine what companies to work with, right? Um, they all sort of sound the same. They all have the same pitches and all this sort of stuff. And you don't really find out whether they're a legitimate company or providing good services until you spend a lot of money with them. And then at that point, you're, you're sort of screwed. Um, Leads Council provides some direction with that as well. I mean, there's, you know, mo- you know, the companies that are generally supporting the Leads Council and a part of it and active, you know, you could be pretty safe that they're, they're doing, the, you know, they're have, their intentions are, are all, all, are all right, you know. Yeah, that, I mean, that is our mission. Um, it's to set standards for the industry where no standards exist. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why it's so complex because there are so many bad actors out there. And I don't know that uh, I would say that it's intentional. Um, uh, the uh, As I go back to complexity, a yeah. lot of this is just sheer ignorance as it <clears throat> relates to just uh, unaware that this exists or this, you know, and, and so... Um, you know, one of the things that I can say about all of that is, is that as we continue to evolve the council, strengthen our standards, build on those, build best practices in, one of the things that this crisis has allowed me to do is start focusing on how can we make that program stronger so that buyers can go out and identify not only people who are members of the council, that's an easy thing, um, but you know, how does that relate to best practices that that company has agreed to do? And and are they using this bit of technology versus this bit of technology or no technology at all? As we evolve our standards and and our self-regulating practices that we continue to build, I think it's going to be a a much more meaningful resource for buyers and other people within the industry. Um, I was uh, I was sitting uh, with Marty Collins from Quinn Street in San, uh, San Francisco last year, and we were across from the solar energy, energy people and, and that an entire association of, of members in the solar field begging for a resource so that they could find compliant lead generators to buy from. Um, they are getting so much pressure from the state regulatory bodies. I mean, I mean, pressure in the sense of threats of we're going to pull your license if you're not more responsible to the consumer. And so as they're sitting there asking, how can we identify sources? We obviously know that that's a that's a gap that the, the council has to fill. Yeah. Yeah. So, so jumping into, um, regulations, obviously, you know, TCPA has been an ongoing discussion for years now. Um, it seems to be coming and maybe correct me, please. Um, it's, but I was going to say, it seems to be coming a little bit more predictable and stable. Am I incorrect or, or correct with that statement with, T, with, with regards to TCPA? Well, <laughs> It depends on what attorney you're talking to. <laughs> yes. Obviously, um, uh, there's some uh, there's some interest there that they have to protect. What I would tell you is, if I just tell somebody TCPA, and I'm talking to, for example, a Marty Collins, I'll pull him back out at Quinn Street. Their compliance program is so strong; they see TCPA in a very checkbox check, check, check way. And and I could clearly see if I were to talk to Marty about you know, TCPA, he says, Rob, it's, it's just consent. And, and, and I do believe that in some, in, in some cases, but then if I talk to somebody else, there's a lot of nuance behind that. And then if I dig even deeper and I look at the way that the FCC still is very vague about what is an automatic telephone dialing system? What do we do about, you know, reassigned phone numbers? There's a lot of risk still that associates itself with calling outbound to consumers. And, and so I can't see it as black and white as some companies who have a very strong compliance program. I have to always worry about those nuances that I think still hit people, especially the smaller companies that don't have in-house counsel and don't have a strong compliance program. I see these TCPA issues that are very fluid as risk. The Mm -hmm. United States Supreme Court this year, prior to the crisis, had on its docket and still does um, a a check on the constitutionality of it all. Will that throw TCPA in yet another, you know, 50,000 foot upwind where we're all scratching our head and wondering, okay, is it constitutional, isn't it? Um, You know, as we look at um, the Trace Act that was passed at the end of last year that President Trump signed 
what we clearly know is that nobody has challenged that as a result of a lot of the topical issues that are going on. But at some point, they've added a criminal element to it that has not seen its light of day yet. And what will that mean for a compliance officer or a CEO that doesn't have their program in check? Will they end up in handcuffs? We don't know. But what we do know is, is that there is a threat. So I would never discount TCPA. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the TRACE Act. That, um, share a little bit of information about what that actually is. Well, I'd like to tell you what the acronym is, but every time I butcher it, so I'll let you look it up. <laughs> it's clearly something you can Google. But, um, you know, it's, it's basically, um, it's empowering multiple bodies the CFPB, which never has been responsible for protecting consumers as it relates to phone calls, the FCC, the FTC, you know, Homeland Security, you could just name it. Uh, there's a laundry list of, of agencies now that have the ability to look at and, and, and tackle and enforce the traced act as it relates to protecting consumers with, you know, illegal telephone activity. And so, uh, the other thing is, is that the price per incident has gone extremely up. Once again, I'll let you Google that. But, but you know, the per call violation could be extremely harmful to companies if they're found guilty. And then, of course, I'll say that, you know, at the end of the day, there's the criminal component. And so, you know, we're talking about a federal enforcement that's across multiple agencies with the ability for one agency to interpret that meaning and law and enforcement capability very differently than another agency. So as soon as we do see this start getting tested, I think we're going to see some problems mm -hmm. within the space of how this thing is being regulated and enforced. Yeah. Um, just, just my crystal ball, but I don't. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and obviously, you know, I don't know if we need the disclaimer to say you're not an attorney either. So, you know, so you're not, you're not providing any. Uh, advice uh, clearly <laughs> I'm not an attorney. No, um, no, but, uh, no, but, but on that note though, um, <laughs> sure. you, you know, you guys do provide a little clarity to some of these confusing, um, things via, uh, the leads council, which is, which is great for, for members as well. Um, okay. So yeah, jumping we're constantly yeah. bringing, we're, yeah, we're go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying we're no, constantly no, yeah. bringing attorneys to the stage. Um, we, in the, in the, um, cycle of webinars that we have, I have three right now where I have attorneys already scheduled to talk about, Great. um, just carved out things, you know, stir shaken. That's another thing that, that we're talking about, you know, blocking calls at the, at the carrier level. There, there's so many levels of this, these things. Um, uh, we're always constantly putting out content. Yeah, that's an interesting topic, right? Because carriers are now taking the initiative to to not even allow text messages to go through or calls, whatever it may be, um, from quote unquote questionable sources, right? Unprecedented. Um, yeah. In the history of phone calls, the carriers have always been mandated to connect the dots. And now uh, for the first time in the history um, they're now given, in, in, in my own opinion, uh, a very broad scope of what to block and what not to block. And so, you know, we're seeing technology right now, platforms within the industry that support the industry, looking at ways to identify a scoring mechanism for a phone number to see is this likely going to be blocked or not. Um, we don't know yet, you know, some of the reporting and then some of, you know, the ways of disputing the blocked. I mean, you might as a call center call out and have no idea that the, the telco company is blocking your call. Uh, very concerning for the industry. A lot of people looking at it, asking for a lot of information that just really isn't available yet. I mean, if you want to talk about an industry changing thing, and it's not just Legion, I mean, we're talking about any, any uh, industry that's doing outbound dial, customer service calls, whatever it may be, um, that's uh, devastating. Not, I mean, it's already hard to get a hold of consumers, right, via the phone these days. Uh, this is a whole other level. One thing I'll remind you is this industry is very resilient. And so as we encounter roadblocks, I sure. would imagine that this industry will evolve. Some won't, but you know, you go back to early days of 
email marketing. And then when CanSpam came along and the sky was falling, uh, we found a way. And so I, re- I really believe in, in the ability for this industry to adopt and, and do what's right. And, yeah. and I think those who follow that will survive and thrive. And those who don't, they'll find themselves on the opposite end yeah. of something they probably don't want. Yeah. And it goes without saying that, you know, a lot of um, consumers these days are utilizing other messaging uh, platforms to communicate anyways, whether it's, you know, Facebook Messenger, LinkedIn Messenger, direct messages on Instagram, Twitter, you know, all these, there's, um, you know, all these other channels that people really prefer to, uh, or seem to be leaning towards uh, versus a picking up the phone and talking to them anyways. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so, so, uh, we want, I thought, tell me if you now, I, I think it was this last year, uh, in, in 2019, where there are a couple of court cases around what an AT, an automated dialing system was. And I thought it kind of went, it wavered back and forth a couple of times. Wasn't there, or am I making that up? Like there, I thought there was something where they were able to, it's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. So what did you see? Uh, what I can tell you, um, you know, we can go back to the Ninth Circuit. I, I do remember, I'm going to go even back. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, the FCC put out these rules and they, they came out with a, you know, ruling. Um, and, and then that was immediately challenged. And, and that appeal uh, from ACA went on for a couple of years. And then uh, the appeal, the ruling for, for that came out and, and tossed us right back up into the air of what is an ATDS. Um, it actually required the FCC to go back and redefine. And they've held some open public comment uh, periods and they're evaluating and, and are required to come back in with a response uh, that we're all waiting for. But what I can tell you is, is that as soon as that appeal came out, I was talking to several attorneys that were spending their time in a court defending these cases. And it was, it it was, you know, two months, three months after, and I was hearing nothing is an ATDS, nothing is qualified as an ATDS. And so therefore TCPA really is non-existent at this point. And then all of a sudden the ninth circuit came out and pretty much said, everything's an ATDS. If it has the ability to, you know, auto dial or store and dial, which your cell phone does, that, could be considered an ATDS. And so um, in every region in these courts that have addressed these have used either those rulings or new rulings to kind of interpret what is an automatic telephone dialing system. And it's a very interesting you know, world that we live in as it results to, depending on where your case is going to be seen and heard, you might fall victim to this is an ATDS or nothing is an ATDS. Um, yeah. You know, and then we're also seeing some things where the courts are staying their cases until the result of the Supreme Court rule. Um, it, it's so fluid. It really is fluid. Yeah. And, and, and all I would go ahead. Yeah. And it goes back to a little bit of what, you know, Marty says, it's really just about getting consent. Right. At the end of the day, if you have consent, this is sort of a relatively a non-issue. Of course, there's certain content that needs to be in that consent. But um, if you're getting it, then. If you're doing, yeah, if you're doing outbound calling to consumers, which B2B, B2C, everybody is a consumer when you're calling this thing. Um, You know, if you're doing outbound dialing, you need consent. I, I don't care if it's automated calls being done on an ATDS the best practice is to get consent. Um, We have a lot of laws right now that are COVID related where we have anti-telemarketing laws in the States. And there's some nuance on, uh, you know, do you have permission? Don't you have permission? Does that actually matter in a case where a state like New York is saying, please stop calling consumers? They're saying, you know, no telemarketing calls, But I think the intent of that, you know, push out from New York and other states like New York is like, right now we have an emergency. Should we be calling people about this or that? And, and, you know, and I think it's really up to each company to get counsel and decide what's important for them as it relates to doing business over the phone. And whether or not that's a direct phone call, a text message, or a, you know, um, a ringless voicemail, which has seen it stay in court this year and last year. I think, you know, people just need to make the right decision for their company based on the advice that their attorneys are giving them at this point. Yeah. Um, what was this, what was the latest on the ringless voicemail? 
Well, I mean, it depends on who you talk to once again. Yeah. But, um, I, the, the courts are finding that they are a phone call and should be considered a phone call and should be considered an ATDS you know, yeah. um, system and, you know, or a TCPA. So there um, needs to be consent. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, once again, not an attorney, but yeah. I'm talking to enough attorneys out there that are saying you should have consent if you're doing ringless voicemail. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so that's, that's sort of the TCPA. What the, the most recent thing that just kind of came out was the, what is it? CCCPA? Is that what it is? <laughs> or CCPA, California yeah. Consumer yeah. Privacy Act, I think, um, which requires people to hold on to data and be able to um, provide that on request based on the certain amount of volume. Tell, tell me, give me, give me, tell me why I'm wrong and, t- and fill in the uh, gaps here on what, what it is. No, no, you're right on, you're right on uh, point with it. I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, as we talk about all of this, the gray, um, this thing was created and pushed through with a lot of areas that the industry had questions about. And, uh, in fact, the industry has sent in many uh, appeals to California asking for delays. Um, one thing that I can tell you, we have not seen any enforcement. We have not seen, by design, there was going to be a six-month window there, but we haven't seen anything challenged in court. We we expected to see something in the court January 1, um, challenging this thing whether yeah. it be from a consumer group or from an industry group. We just expected to see it, and yet we've not seen anything. And we've already seen revisions to the law that have incorporated things like the Americans with Disability Act, um, you know, something completely different that, you know, we don't talk about. But, you know, the one thing that I will say is that this is here. It's, it's going to stay. It's only going to be more cumbersome for companies to adhere to because there is an intent both at the state and the federal level to protect the privacy of consumers. This thing was originally, I think, scripted to talk about those big companies out there like the Facebooks and the Googles and the, you know, the, and the, and the companies that have these massive groups that privacy is an issue. But as it started to evolve and eventually become law in California, we started seeing that that scope broadened to include many of the companies that do business in the Legion space. So, you know, once again, it's so fluid. I would recommend every company, regardless of what you think the rule says and applies to you, seek advice, seek counsel, make sure that you have the best information available to you as you're collecting, collecting data, talking to consumers, dealing with consumers, and be ready to respond with what that law on the surface looks like it, it requires, um, you know. Yeah. And, and so, ba- so just generally though, is, is it, it's based on um, if a company is collecting information on data and personal, um, personal information or leads um, at over a certain amount, um, they have to, co- they have to store and uh, they have to store every action that's been taken on that piece of a record. Is that, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's not just phone calls. It could be anything, email communications, you know, back end updates to your CRM. There's a lot of nuance about it. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to get into the particulars once again, because they're fluid. I would say it right now in two weeks from now, it's going to be a bit different, different yeah. thing. Uh, I would definitely say seek counsel, but at the end of the day, you know, what portion of your revenue deals with buying and selling of leads? Um, how many records and customers do you deal with? What type of business you're in? Uh, you know, it, they're, they're, it, it's so broad at this point. Most lead generation companies, performance marketing companies fall under this. But the one thing that, you know, not just CCPA, I did a webinar, uh, I think at your show earlier this year, where, you know, Jonathan Pomp and, and his partners were on the stage with us. And, and they indicated, you know, at that time, no fewer than 14 additional states were adopting their own privacy laws. One of the things that's really concerning to the industry, and, it's, and, and it goes far beyond CCPA, is will we end up with 50 unique privacy laws for the industry to follow? Yeah, and that's crazy. really scary. Yeah. The industry wants to see a federal mandate that supersedes all of this so that we can follow one law. I got to be honest with you, we're further away from that right now than we are. 
And, and, and uh, that should be the most concerning thing to some of these people, Colorado, Nevada, you know, I mean, Utah, Connecticut, we're, we're looking at states just popping up right and left, protecting their consumers under their own set of rules. That's, and of that's, course, that's, that's concerning. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that, you know, each state wants to have their own piece, a little, you know, customization, right? So it's, it's, there's no chance it's all going to be, you know, similar to another state. You know, they're, they're, they're going to be through, throw something in there to be unique, of course. Well, Senator Sessions from your stage uh, from Colorado sat up and said, look, you know, we're, we're making stronger privacy laws. We're also, looking at adding new anti-telemarketing laws into our state to also reduce the flow of incoming uh, calls to our consumers. And, and, you know, I, this is, and once again, this backs up to the very beginning of this podcast where the council sees this as, you know, our mission and, and our purpose in life because of the complex nature of what's going on. It certainly creates opportunity for membership for us, but it does put a demand on us to be much more, you know, part of that educational side of it. Just, it's crazy how fast this stuff is coming up. Yeah, it sure is. So um, the other, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was about the CFPB, which you brought up, Um, you know, uh, four years ago, the CFPB was sort of the main driver, a lot of, uh, you know, communication and action being taking place on behalf of the consumer. Um, Of course, that's changed uh, since the new administration's come in. Is that still, um, where, where's the, what's the, what's, where's the CFPB these days, uh, in comparison to, you know, four, uh, six years ago? You know, um, I, I follow everything that you just said is correct. Um, the CFPB, when I started this job, <clears throat> like I said, yeah. just over five years ago, it was the number one focus of the industry, especially those in the, in the finance uh, part of it, the consumer financial protection bureau. Yeah. Um, and, and, what I can say is as a result of an administration sh- switch, the, he promised on his platform that he was going to come in and deregulate. And what we found was, you know, the CFPB was set up at a time where the, it, was, it was supposed to be independent. It wasn't supposed to be underneath any authority right. of government. And, and, and quickly as the administration came in, and placed a new leader inside of the CFPB, we did see a downtick in, in where the focus of the industry was because it didn't seem so oppressive at the time. What I can tell you, like every single thing that at the federal level was a primary focus for the industry, as a result of that deregulation at the top, what we have now seen is that the 50 states have come together and started to put in their own CFPB. In fact, California leading the way. There are many conversations about the creation of their own CFPB and where that's going to come back. Mm. And I would suspect, knowing California, I would suspect it not only will be what the CFPB was four years ago, it probably now with four years of maturity will be even more um, aggressive towards those who aren't protecting consumers in the financial uh, market. So, you know, I do believe as administrations will change, whatever year that ends up being, that the CFPB, depending on what happens to it between administrations, will also see a rise in what it's going to do. And I do believe that it will resurface as a very strong entity on the industry and we need to constantly be focused on it. Um, We also need to support them too. One of the things that I think I've seen, which was really you know, for me, eye opening and learning is when I first got into this, I was like, those are the enemy and those are the enemy and we have to hunker down, you know, and what I have found is, is that there's a common theme here between those regulatory bodies of protecting the consumer and the industry has to have an alignment with that same mindset of we need to protect the consumer as we continue to evolve technologies and practices within the industry. And and that should be always checkbox number one. You know, does this protect the consumer? Does it provide a value to the consumer? And then we can get into the nuance of all of the things that we've been talking about, about telephones (laughs) and privacy. But, you know, if we don't, if we don't shift to that mindset, we're constantly going to be under attack for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good that you're absolutely right, too. I remember, uh, you know, when all this coming out, it was it was very much, you know, defensive. Um, But when you start talking to these individuals and even the sessions that was up on um, in in lead generation world, I mean, the guy wants to do what's right 
for everybody, not just the consumer, but he's not sure. trying to kill companies and do things, but we, you know, there's, there's gotta be some regulations in place that are going to protect people. I'm, you know, I get calls every day that are robo calls and are completely illegal. And, um, you know, it's frustrating. Yeah, you get text, yeah, that's you the get most text important messages. part of what you just said. Yeah. 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 I, I want to point out and make sure that, you know, if somebody listens to this and they're like, Oh, this is just an industry trying to protect itself. The vast majority of those calls that you're getting are illegal. And it doesn't matter what type of law or rule or technology shift that we come to, as long as there's a way for somebody to sit in their basement on a 1995 laptop and push a button to a million calls, you know, phone numbers with a hidden phone number that it's coming from, that's going to still take place. We do need to evolve from that. But I mean, I think it's important to know that the vast majority of people within this space have the consumer's interest first and foremost. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's what I find, especially the members of the council. It's one yeah. of the reasons why they've joined. You know, I'm, I'm, before we uh, wrap up here, I am kind of curious um, uh, uh, to get your personal opinion on, on the industry as a whole. You, it's not that you're new to marketing. Gosh, you've been, you've been in the marketing world for, for a long time. But, you know, entering into um, more specifically the lead generation industry five years ago with the Leads Council and really being thrown to the fire <laughs> in, in that regard, you know, being a part of an association of, yeah, of sure. uh, groups and industries uh, and regulatory topics. Um, I'm kind of curious to get your opinion on what sort of you've seen as the evolution, if any, in the lead gen and your overall opinion of the lead gen industry, um, when you look at companies growing or not growing and coming in and out of favor, lead buyers, maturity, that, that sort of thing, what, what just kind of a really general, uh, comment on, on the industry from your perspective over the last five years. Well, I want to start off by saying everything I've said has been my opinion (laughs) (laughs) Uh, up to this point. Um, so I'll continue with that opinion. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, as I mentioned a couple of times in, in, in this podcast alone, I, I see this as a very community driven um, world, especially, you know, when we, you talked about leads con and now lead generation world, these are people we see on a daily basis. And, and it's, it's been great to get to know these people. And what's, what's clear is that this is a relationship industry especially if you're going to survive in this. If I get out to some other conferences that, you know, where we're talking about, you know, affiliate type stuff and, you know, some gray area, it, it becomes less of that. But for the core of where we focus and this industry of performance marketing, um, the technology is certainly driving uh, the evolution of the industry. Um, companies such as um, Jornaya and Active Prospect um, putting third-party lead verification so that, you know, a buyer when they buy the lead now knows that at least the lead generator went through these steps to give them a compliant lead. I see more of that coming. Um, that's really encouraging because I think the days of raising your hand and saying, I do, I promise, you know, I'm going to follow. And, you know, I, I look, human nature is to do what we can to, to protect ourselves and to protect our business. And sometimes there's a little bit of, you know, you know, what is the line, you know, and, and does that line move for me? I think that the industry moving to more technology driven solutions to move that human element and that human error and that ignorance of, is it right or wrong out? That's where our focus needs to be. Um, I don't believe that we're going to get along without it. And so watching those companies, you know, watching call center technology, um, you know, we, we, we have several members, you know, on our council that have technology that's, that's driving, you know, Convoso is one of them that comes to mind that, it, you know, is fo- focused on protecting the consumer when they develop their technology. I, I think that has to be the mindset of the industry. I certainly, as I look at the core of the council and those members and board members that I work with daily, that is every day their conversation. And so if we can continue to push our messaging out and continue to convince people that if they start there, the revenue will drive behind it. It certainly will. The growth will drive behind it. And therefore, 
you as a consumer will start getting less of those unwanted calls, which really ultimately we all are consumers. And so we mm -hmm. always have to look at ourselves first as like, is this in the best interest of myself? Right. And so I'm, I'm loving the technology component of it. I'm loving the industry camaraderie, the people who are coming together and saying, you know what? I care about you. I drop my company hat off at the table and I'm going to sit down at the table with all of my competitors and we're going to do the right thing for the industry and the right thing for the consumer, man, dude, this is, I got to be honest out of all the jobs I've done air traffic control in the Navy. You know, I've owned my own print and mail shop. I mean, I've gone through the gamut. This has been the most rewarding position I've ever served in. And it's an honor to be in this position. And so when I come up and I talk on, you know, about things like this, man, dude, it's coming from here. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's awesome, Rob. Yeah, I know. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. And I, I, you know, I really appreciate your opinion on this and I think it's frankly, um, you know, right on. Uh, so if obviously people can, I, I want people to go to um, the Leeds Council website. I want them to set up a call with you and learn more about it. I think it's really important um, for this industry um, for, for everybody should be a part of the Leeds Council. There's just, just no um, if and buts about it. If you're, if you're good, if you want to be a long lasting company in here, I think you need to be a part of a group, an association that's trying to do the right thing. That's trying to push this industry for further growth. So that's being a part of the Leeds Council, in my opinion, and of course, coming to Legion world, but um, uh, how do they do that? What's your, what's, what email can they shoot you um, a message at and set up a call? Absolutely. So we've got several ways, uh, you know, we have leadscouncil.org. I would encourage everybody to go out. <clears throat> One of the benefits of membership is we do have a membership directory that we're quickly adding to. And, and, and those are some of the benefits, but you can check out those benefits under our membership um, link on the site. Uh, there's a contact us page. And then obviously you can always reach out at rob at leadscouncil.org uh, to reach out directly. I'm, I'm always available and I try my best to respond as quickly as possible. We've got a lot of work going on right now, so please be patient, but I will get back to you. And, uh, you know, I do believe with what you just said, everybody that does business in this space should be a member. I, I, I just can't say it, you know, any other way. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rob, for joining me today. We'll do it again. I wish you the best of luck with the, uh, the webinar series, and hopefully people can go to the website and check that out as well. Um, probably follow you on LinkedIn, too. I assume you're going to promote that on LinkedIn as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for joining. Let's do it again, hopefully soon and catch up and, and see what's going on. And maybe you can provide some different updates, um, with what the council is up to and what's happening out in the regulatory, uh, world as well. It's always fun. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mike. Thanks a lot, man, for the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah.